Pukic, who's on mute, but a wave. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, this evening we do have, well, uh, so um, just a quick moment of silence for the passing of, of a uh, public safety servant and Joe Kohanic, who was laid to rest at funeral on Monday, November 9th. Thank you. With that said, um, we have a presentation from the Department of Transportation and uh, Mr. James Solomy from the town of Rocky Hill will introduce. Thanks, James. You're welcome, Mr. Um, at your last public safety committee meeting, you had some questions about the uh, project going on on Cromwell Avenue Route 3. I contacted uh, the DOT and uh, we, they got us in touch with uh, John Court, who is online, I believe, John Court, and Jay Lockaby. John is a transportation supervising engineer with the DOT. He's been with them for 36 years and he oversees the department's intelligent transportation systems program. And he's currently the interim supervisor of the division of traffic engineering and the traffic signal lab. Uh, he also is the tech, has the technical expertise and support to all the state's traffic signals and coordinated systems in the state. Uh, he has a, a BS in electrical uh, systems, a master's of uh, public administration. We also have Jay Lockaby, who is a professional engineer and a uh, transportation engineer uh, in the traffic signal unit of Connecticut DOT. Uh, he is currently the project design engineer for Connecticut DOT's project to replace the computerized traffic signal system and deploy adaptive signal controls and connected vehicle technology along Route 5 and Route 15. So the project that's currently going on in on Cromwell Avenue and West Street uh, is going to get this new technology. Currently, the traffic signals on Route 3 are being coordinated through a DOS-based system, which I thought was long gone with the dinosaurs. So they're going to try to bring us up. Yeah, you're smiling. They're going to try to bring us up to speed and then some. So I think this is a great uh, thing they're doing for the town. And I'm going to turn it over to John Court. And I believe our John uh, Murphy will be taking us through the slides that you should have in front of you. So I'm going to- Thank you, James. You. You're welcome. Uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to do this presentation to the Town of Rocky Hills uh, Council Safety Committee. Um, so we have two parts or really three parts for this presentation. Jay's going to start out. He's going to give us a, some discussion on our traffic signal assets. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about some of the technology. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the benefits. And then we can do a questions and answer. So I'm going to turn this over to Jay. Well, thank you. Uh, and thanks for having us. Um, just a little bit more background about what I do um, within the traffic signal unit at the Department of Transportation. Um, we're looking at really managing all of our assets, uh, trying to spend the, the money in the best way we can, the most uh, efficient way we can. We, we're trying to identify spots uh, that are high priority. Uh, so we're doing a lot of screening of uh, our entire roadway network as, long, as well as all of our signals. Um, and with that, uh, you can go to the first slide. Uh, so, as a whole, our state DOT owns uh, 2,560. It's actually more like 2,700 when you add in some of the flashing beacons across the state. Um, and that is actually more than all of the other New England state DOTs own and maintain combined. Uh, so, when you're looking at the New England region, we're really uh, taking out some unprecedented traffic signal maintenance uh, responsibilities. Uh, next next slide. Um, just to more, so as, as I said, we're putting together a lot of data. We're trying to identify the hotspots across Connecticut. You know, what's the most efficient way that we can spend our time and the state's money to make the highest impact. So 
it's kind of identified as, you know, here's our population densities overlaid with our traffic signals. So our traffic signals are all the dots and the population densities in the background. Um, you know, you have your, our current Hartford area and you can see there's pretty much a correlation between the population densities and traffic signals as, as we expect. Um, and just to highlight, you know, we have um, vehicles traveling through our traffic signals all, almost 57 million times a day. So by identifying our traffic signal program as a priority, uh, we can make a large impact with just hopefully small uh, labor and uh, money. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Again, this is similar, um, <clears throat> you know, along with making it uh, more efficient for passenger friendly cars. We're also looking to help out the economy with freight and this kind of same correlation where you have a higher population density, you have higher freight generators, we generally have more traffic signals. So just another uh, showing of how important our traffic signals are. Slide. Um, yeah, so as, as James was saying, we still have we still have signals on DOS-based controllers. Um, and John can go a little bit more into the operations uh, side of it. Uh, but even then, just the actual physical poles out there are very old. Over half of them are over 20 years old. And especially when you look at um, the large amount of signals we installed in the 90s, um, those were only designed with about 25 years of service life and they're all expiring soon. So we, uh, we have a large backlog of traffic signals that we're trying to maintain and upgrade uh, in the very near future. Near future. Um, as well as we don't have communication or connection to most of our signals, only about a third of our signals connected. So what that means is it takes a long time for us to get a, you know, we have to wait until somebody complains about a signal. We can't proactively go out and fix signals before um, we get reported of a problem. Um, so one of our goals in the future, as John will talk about, is getting connected to all those signals, proactively maintaining them, fixing them so that the public doesn't even realize anything's wrong. Um, so yeah, so a lot of it installed 20, 30 years ago, and they're all about reaching the end of their service life. Next slide. One huge aspect we've had uh, as far as maintaining our traffic signals are the in-ground loop detectors that we've used for a very long time in Connecticut. Um, we have had trouble maintaining those um, as every winter the pavement heaves from the frost. They break our loop detectors in the roadway whenever there's construction on a local road. If somebody uh, you know, installs a new sprinkler system maybe on their building and they might you know, cut through one of our loops, then it immediately negates the usefulness of the traffic signal, essentially. Uh, so there, there, we've had a lot of maintenance issues with loop detectors. So the next you know, future wave of video uh, of vehicular detection is video. Um, so this is, part of our proactive approach to install reliable detection so that our signals aren't operating on recall and uh, screwing up the corridor and the, the uh, main line. Um, so as we're going through and upgrading our traffic signals, we're putting in modern video detection and we're also upgrading our older traffic signals as say when we go through and repave a road, we go through and install traffic uh, videos at all the traffic signals when we go through and repave the road. Um, I think that's it for my slide. I think the next slide is yours, John. Yes. Thank you. Um, so Jay was hitting on something that was really important for our future in Connecticut, and that's to have better detection. Um, one of the things that we've learned, um, kind of the hard knocks, is that the detection helps us uh, time the traffic signals better. And we've learned from states like Utah, Georgia, um, they have new technology, not just with what we put on the field, but how they actually develop the timing. 
So the key is for us is to put this detection in, this type of detection, so that we can use the information from that detection um, from our facility in Newington, uh, where we can monitor what's going on. We can get numerations, we can get values, measurements um, in real time. And of course, what that does is that gives us um, better data, which leads to better decisions. Um, for a quick example, so if I use up in the right-hand corner on this slide, it's a Everyday Counts 4. It's a federal highway initiative. It's called Automated Traffic Signal Performance Measures. So under the Berlin Turnpike Reconstruction Project, we're going to install some new technology. But the benefit is, because of what we're doing on West Street and what we're doing on Route 3, is we're going to take this new technology from the Berlin Turnpike and apply it to those traffic signals as well. And so we're in the process of constructing these traffic signals on Route 3. And once they're complete, we should be able to connect it to these new software programs. And it gives us better data to make the better decisions. And a quick example would be, if we think that there's a certain amount of cars on West Street, if there's an accident in I-91 and we close I-91 and it gets diverted onto West Street and it either goes down to the Salestine Highway, Route 99, or it goes over to Route 3, we'll be able to notice that, we'll be able to pick up on that and make timing adjustments in real time. Uh, go to the next slide. So what is it that we get out of this? Well, you know, some typical things would be, um, I'm gonna skip through the crashes for the second, uh, but let's talk about the efficiency of the traffic signals. So on a daily basis, we provide these coordinated timing plans and it helps us reduce the travel times. It helps improve delays and stops. There is a system out there now. It is a DOS, it's a DOS-based system. Um, it has old technology. The communications cable was in one of uh, Jay's previous slides. The communications cable is so old that when our technicians touch it, the outer sheeting starts falling apart in their hand. So one of the things that we're gonna do is improve that communications cable with fiber optic cable, give us faster speed, give us better information. And it helps us provide better flow. Uh, we know that there's a lot of curb cuts on Route 3, uh, not so much on West Street, um, but those curb cuts can help slow down traffic. But if we time the intersections when the cars arrive to the traffic signals, they'll have a better drive. Well, obviously that turns into um, reduced fuel consumption and it's a lot of savings for commuters, for uh, customers that go to the businesses on Route 3. Um, one of the things that we've learned too is that the amount of friction that you get from those driveways we can help mitigate that with the coordination. So uh, an example would be if we had a certain amount of green time on Route 3 and we have a certain amount of time on, say, a side street like Route 160, uh, we can time those better so we can improve that flow. So when they arrive, how many cars are coming out of those side streets and so on. Well, obviously, it turns in when we have better flow and the cars aren't sitting at traffic lights longer, with that improved detection that Jay was talking about, uh, we would be able to reduce the emissions and pollutants into the air. So one of the things that we kind of want to focus here a little bit is on the reduced number of traffic severity of crashes. Um, when you improve traffic flow, you actually have less accidents. A typical one would be rear end type accidents. So if we have a lot of stops going down the traffic signals, uh, the probability of having more rear end accidents is higher. And when you have better flow, people are not so much willing to switch lanes. They want to stay in their lane so you won't have those side swipe same type accidents. Next slide. So what we're doing, what we're going to do for the Route 3 and West Street corridor is nothing new to Connecticut DOT, um, nothing new to some other states. We've actually done a couple of uh, uh, pilot locations, uh, Route 10 in Southington. Um, that's down on I-84, exit 32. And we can see from this image that it's a fair number of intersections. The corridor is very similar to West Street and to Route 3. So we had some great results when we did this timing technique to these intersections with this new detection. Um, it's quite easy for us to do it and made it happen much quicker. Um, that's another thing that's happened in the past where and Jay was talking about you know, older detection and how difficult it was to deal with it. Well, and it's the kind of the same thing in the traffic observation, traffic modeling world. When you have old data and you don't have the right data, um, your models don't come out well and your timing isn't as, isn't as done as well. 
So with this new technology, this new way of looking at things through the signal performance measures, you're actually using values from the, tech, the detectors and the traffic signal controllers, and it allows you to do better timing. Uh, next slide. Another route here, we just did uh, last year, Route 99, Rocky Hill and Weathersfield, um, off uh, exit 90, exit 24, I think I got a little block here. Anyway, exit 24. So what does this mean? So we applied the same technology with timing in this corridor. Um, back before COVID, we were having a lot of problems with the construction project in the, co in the uh, I-91 corridor. We had the um, Route 160 bridge that had to be reconstructed. We have the Charter Oak Bridge reconstruction area. So a lot of people were getting off the highway, taking these local routes. Uh, sometimes it was closures, sometimes it was uh, multiple lane closures and people were just getting off through ways and so on. So we took this timing technique, this timing plan technique, applied it to these traffic signals and we had great results. Obviously things changed during COVID. So we monitored what was happening with all those timing plans and made some adjustments. Next slide. So again, what, what are we getting out of this? So there's a, a quite a bit of cost here for this project in Rocky Hill, which is about a little less than $4 million. And it's expensive, um, but it was it's worth it because one, Jay gets his asset program replaced for these locations. Uh, we get to retime the traffic signals and the public receives the benefits. So for the two quarters that I just talked about, Route 10 in Southington and Route 99, Rocky Hill, Weathersfield, for over five years, these are the types of values you save. These are the, these are the real, real numbers. Um, when you improve flow, obviously you uh, reduce the amount of time that you're on the corridor, uh, makes it more efficient for businesses. Um, and obviously we save some fuel, um, saves their, the commuter's time, uh, which we can be used. There's a calculation that we're using from the Texas Transportation Institute, which is supported by Federal Highway. And these numbers that we grab from these evaluations get converted into dollar factors. Uh, next slide. So Jay mentioned that he's the project engineer, project supervisor for the Berlin Turnpike. And I mentioned to you before that we're gonna take some of that technology from the Berlin Turnpike and apply it on these quarters that we're doing in Rocky Hill. So advanced signal technology for the Berlin Turnpike, once this Pearl and Turnpike project starts, we'll start up the computers, the software, and we can connect any number of intersections anywhere in the state that we want to. So that's where the value comes in for the Route 3 project. So you can see that we're gonna do some uh, technology what they call SPAT, signal phasing and timing. And it doesn't have a whole lot for us around here. It doesn't, has less meaning for the commuters and the users of Route 3, but it has a lot to do with what Federal Highway is trying to do for technology and traffic signals. So we got the connected vehicle technology. This is kind of a, again, something that really doesn't affect the daily commuter. It's something that Federal Highway wants the states to push. And this is happening around the country. Uh, it's where the vehicle can actually get information from the traffic signal when it's gonna turn red, when it's gonna turn yellow, green, and so on. And it's the beginning of the new technology for some of these vehicles. Everybody knows that oh, some of these new cars are coming out and they tell you that there's a car next to you. They tell you if you're going over a lane line, um, this is part of it. So then the car will know when the traffic light's gonna turn yellow. Well, it has to time into how the control, control the traffic, I'm sorry, the vehicle will control the driver. So you think that, well, if the, that driver is going to know that it's going to turn yellow, they're going to go faster to try to run the yellow. It actually works in reverse. When the car is in control of the driver, it will stop when it's supposed to stop. Adaptive traffic signal control. This is a big one for us because it's a new technology that Federal Highway is pushing. That's where the signal technology is making the decisions on its own through computer algorithms of what timing to use. So we talked about how you know, I-91 traffic can go on to these local roads for, for Rocky Hill. Uh, the system will identify it and it'll make adjustments based on that traffic demand. Uh, we talked briefly about the tra automated traffic signal performance measures. Again, that's really new numbers that are coming in and feeding programs like the adaptive traffic signal control. They are actual measurements from the traffic signal, not hypothetical models, et cetera. One of the things that's coming up and it's a big thing uh, for the northern states is snowplow priority. 
Uh, this is where if the light is green and the snow plow is out at two o'clock in the morning and the light wants to turn yellow for one car and the snow plows are coming up in an echelon, we want them to kind of get through there safely and keep moving because when we clear the snow quicker, it'll be ready for the morning rush hour and for the commuters and the safety of our public. Um, obviously, fiber communications, it helps us do more in a faster manner. Uh, so I think that's it for me, Jay. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Uh, you Excellent. can go to the next slide. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure everybody's wondering. So yeah, we're doing all these fancy things for vehicles. Um, what are we doing for pedestrians? And um, like I said earlier, a lot of these signals were constructed. We did we did a lot of signal work in the back in the '90s, and really just the pedestrian facilities were not out there. Um, sometimes you'll see at an older signal, it'll just be a a lone pedestal in the middle of the grass, and it'll say push here for green light, but nobody knows what that means. <laughs> so as we're going through, we're upgrading the signals, we're putting in uh, pedestrian signal heads at any crossing. Um, some of these uh, will be concurrent. So that means that if the art, if the artery is going and there's nobody on the side street and there's a, there's a, the walking man, then you can cross the street with the artery. Um, in other locations, we're looking at a new uh, signal technology called the leading pedestrian interval, where um, if you're afraid of a potential right turn conflict, when both the side street and the signal head get a green light, then you can give a leading interval to the pedestrian crossing the street about four to five seconds, so that a vehicle turning right can see the pedestrian crossing and yield to the pedestrian in the crosswalk. Um, so yeah, like I said, um, making sure that we clarify to pedestrians and drivers that when they can cross, make sure there's a visible pedestrian indication, make sure, making sure all the uh, sidewall ramps are ADA compliable, making sure we have marked crosswalks out there at all times when there's a crossing, um, and, and truly really trying to balance this very difficult thing to balance of vehicular um, progression and also pedestrian safety and mobility. Um, and we try to do the best we can. Like I said, there's some things where, um, you know, we, we can give a pedestrian a little bit, a couple of seconds to establish themselves out in the streets before a, the vehicles get a green light. Um, and, but, but it's always, you have to design with, uh, we call it being context sensitive. So, uh, you know, obviously if you're next to a high school with a lot of kids, you, you want to put in an exclusive pedestrian phase where, You'd have a pedestrian phase that is uh, exclusive to the timing it takes for the pedestrian to cross the street and all the cars have a red light. Um, and, you know, in, in, along Route 3, that's not necessarily always the best context to have. In, in certain places it is, and I think under the design of the project, there are some exclusive pedestrian phases. Um, but when we can't give an exclusive pedestrian phase, like I said, we're looking at putting these new signal ind indications, making sure the drivers and pedestrians can both see exactly when they're supposed to cross and who's crossing. Um, I th think that's it for that slide. Uh, next slide. John, did so, you want to take this one back yeah. over? Yeah, okay. so what are we gonna do, all right? So we're gonna have all this technology. We're gonna be able to see everything all real time, real good stuff. Well, there's gonna be staff here at Connecticut DOT, the new Highway Operations Center. And that staff will be monitoring all of this technology. They'll be able to provide these benefits. Uh, a big thing that we're showing on the right side of this um, slide is that information from the user interface to operations. And a big part of it is, is providing the information to the public so that the public can see exactly what we're doing. Because we know right now we're not doing that. But other states have actually gotten very good at this, where they can show what the results are, how positive they can be. And if you have any problems with it, if you have any questions, the department would be available to uh, have the contact with the engineers or get information on their own through the website. Um, I'm going to try to speed this up because I know we're running out of time. So the next slide. So this is the part that I'm talking about, right? So we can see in Lincoln, Nebraska, they've gone through the uh, trials and tribulations of putting this information out. So they show exactly what they're doing. They show exactly the benefits that they have and Connecticut is gonna replicate that. 
Um, it's in the best interest, not only for the Department of Transportation, but I think it helps the municipalities so that if there's any questions from the public, they can say, oh, the website has this information. You can take a look at it. So the last thing I wanted to mention is that for this project, we're going to do a before and after study. Well, it doesn't mean a lot right now because I'm just saying it, but the before and after study will actually be on this web page. It'll be called CTDOT Greenlight. Um, that'll be a page on the department's website that will have all this information that we're seeing to the left from Lincoln, Nebraska. And that concludes our slides. Uh, any questions? Uh, Councillor John Emanuel, any questions? Yeah, actually, um, <clears throat> this might be for John. I have a couple of questions, John. So are, are you familiar with some of the side streets on Route 3? I am. I'm very familiar okay. with Rocky Health Roads. Um, so the, there seems there seems to be timing uh, timing on the current lights. So because there's so many driveways on Cromwell Avenue, that if I'm pulling out of a location that there's there's space between the lights changing, that I have time to exit instead of a constant flow of traffic. Does this change that? Does this, so people going north and south on Route 3, does it, in, does it increase the, the flow of that? So it would be more difficult for me to exit out of some of those driveways? Excellent question. What I'm, a, what it, I'm asking is, does it narrow the gap, I guess? Um, time of day, right? So we know that morning rush hour can be fairly busy, non-COVID, non-COVID. We know that the morning rush hour, we can have a certain amount of commuters out there. Yes, there are breaks where vehicles can exit and enter these driveways. Um, the, the vehicles will stay closer together, what we call platoons. So they will be staying closer together and they will arrive at the right time. And we deal with this a lot. And the way that the system will work will create those opportunities for vehicles to exit. Um, it'll change like the amount of time that you actually get. So it may be during the morning rush hour, you're gonna get about 15, 16, 17 seconds to exit out these driveways or go into the driveways. Um, in the afternoon, um, you might get a little bit more. It could be up to 20 seconds because it, it'll change based on the amount of vehicles and the openings will have a better cluster or there'll be a better cluster for the openings. Okay, all right, great. And my second question is, if I was going, for example, well, I'll give you an experience. I went, uh, I was going north on Route 3 from Inwood Road, right? And I think there was a Connecticut transportation building there um, going north and going to New Britain Avenue. I think there's about nine or 10 lights and I hit every single light and it was about 10 minutes just to go two miles. If I was going 40, going through Inwood Road, going north and I had the green light, would this guarantee a green light all the way going up, going all the way up to New Britain Avenue? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't want to do that, right? Because if I'm doing that right now, if I get you uh, that amount of vehicles or amount of vehicles to get through that many intersections, the weight on the side streets will be unbearable. Okay. They would have to wait longer to get out. And of course, all kinds of things start happening then. People start running lights and so on. Right. What we're trying to do is we'll get you five or six view, uh, traffic lights that you can get through. You're probably going to stop at the main intersection of route, um, you know, West Street at Route 3. Um, that's got its own characteristics going there. Then after you get through that intersection, you should be able to flow through the rest of the intersections. So that's how we're looking at going into the future that we're going to watch this platooning. Um, we're going to try to break it up a little bit, but in between those breaks, you're going to do very well. Okay. And then my final question is on some of these minor side streets going into route three, if one car was coming out of those side streets and sitting at the light, does that play an equal amount of importance as, for example, somebody sitting at Elm Street at Route 3 waiting to come onto Cromwell Avenue? So if a car coming out of a small side street every three minutes, would they be triggering that light or would it be a different time frame than a busier side street coming onto Route 3? So, so John, I was going to say, actually, so what we do is we time it so that it'll give enough green for that one vehicle. But if there's no vehicles to extend the green on the side street, then it'll turn off the green. On gotcha. the side street. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. you know, it's, it's more reactive. 
than just, okay, we got somebody on the side street, let's give them 20 seconds to give them enough time for one car. Correct, yes. And it'll give any leftover time to the artery. Okay, perfect, thank you. Councilor Prakash. Yeah, great presentation. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'll try to squeeze in like a couple of questions quickly is uh, people don't want like time. Uh, so uh, what percentage of uh, Rocky Hill streets are connected right now? The signals I should say uh, are connected. You said like statewide it's what, 38%? 30, 38% 30 is the amount of computerized traffic signal systems. Right, and what percentage of Rocky Hill signals are? It's a high percentage because you actually have a fair amount of intersections on Route 99. You got almost all of the intersections on West Street. You've got Route 3 starting from the northern Route 160 sec segment down to the southern sec segment. I'm sorry, the yeah, down to the southern no, segment I, of Route I, 160. The reason, the reason I was asking that was just to uh, lead it, just to give you some context. Uh, how do you pick these locations for these kind of like uh, changes more? Um, more advanced. Uh, some of those slides showed like the advanced work you're going to do. Um, I was thinking like, you know, is there an objective where you pick these sites and if Rocky can be on the front end of that? That's why I'm asking that question. So Jay, if I might, um, our objective of our current administration is to connect all 2,700 traffic signals. That's our objective. That's our 10 year plan. That will actually part of that website. Uh, other states have done it as well. Utah has got about half the intersections of us, but they're connected to all their intersections. That's our goal. Our goal is to connect so that all of them will be there. Right now, for these projects like this one, um, they're based on volume, uh, intersection proximity, number of crashes. Um, if there's any unusual circumstances like diverting I-91 traffic onto your routes, uh, that comes up as a big player. Yeah, th because th I was I was hoping that, you know, because you picked uh, Route 3 right now uh, for Bullington Pike, there must be a good objective reason for it. So going forward to like, we can be at the forefront of this, uh, hopefully, uh, as you make more of these things connected and as you go into like more like, uh, you know, connected cars and things like that, which was very interesting, by the way. Well, one last question I wanted to ask you, this is more like my, my personal curiosity. Do you use any kind of like uh, optimization algorithms, linear programming, anything like that to optimize these wait times on these signals or how much the flow time should be? Or is it more just like, you know, this is based on experience on more like uh, empirical data or you actually model it and use some kind of linear programming or optimization function? To keep it short, um, so we use Synchro right now. It's yeah. a modeler, but it's also a timing plan program. Um, going in the future though, that I'm gonna go back to those automated traffic signal performance measures. That will be the program that we use to time traffic signals in the future because it's real measurements. We're taking real data from what's actually happening out there and applying that to the timing. And then we provide the benefits and how much time we're saving, how much fuel we're saving. So it'll, it'll actually change. Again, this is something that a lot of the states are using and Connecticut hasn't been using it, but we will be using it. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was going to say one last thing about the modeling. You can only put in so much about modeling. Like, for example, if if there's one lane and you can scoot around the car taking a left, I mean, that's a model just can't do that. So it's all about real time, uh, you know, look, either looking at it or looking at the data real time. You know, because the reason I ask you again, like this can be a full sidewalk on uh, yeah, yeah. Nice slide in there, like, or at least a picture that said, why model something you can measure? Yeah. I don't know at the end or something and I was uh, you had just a picture there and that made me wonder like how much you model this stuff how much you actually do it on the real package. I, I, I'd like to finish with that with this Utah DOT spent 8,000 hours developing this program we get it for free no cost all we have to do is put the application on a server and get the software loaded and get the web access so that's those because federal highway federal highway paid for that program they paid for the eight thousand dollars or eight thousand hours and we're going to reap the benefits of that awesome no thank you so much this is very interesting yep mayor any questions well one of the, just a comment one of the things mr court uh, didn't say was this presentation was given to governor lamont and he's supporting it all the way uh so it's way overdue and rocky hill will be an early beneficiary especially with $4 million worth of equipment. Um, so we're gonna benefit from all this technology. 
It may take a while to see it. I don't know how long it's going to take to finish this. And once the computers are up and running, we're good to go. Um, James, just to add what you're saying. So right now, um, the project is at 65% complete but the actual work done is 16%. So they're behind. They're supposed to finish in February of 21. I don't think that's gonna happen. I was out there today and they're, they're behind. Usually it's because they have to wait for the steel to be manufactured for the poles. Uh, it takes a substantial amount of time. Yeah. Nonetheless, as soon as this equipment is installed and the contractor says, I'm done, we will take over from there and we will go through the um, effort to retime the traffic signals and we will keep a constant eye on it. We're just not gonna let it go once we're done. Yeah, we're experiencing the same problem with our project on Route 99. Yeah, with yeah. supplies. Ed, can I uh, ask one one quick question, um, John? Actually, this is for for Mike Garrity. Does the fire equipment have the light turning sink <clears throat> capability? I, I forgot. Preemption. Yeah. Yes, it does on a lot of intersections. I don't have the entire list in front of me. But no, yes. no, I wasn't. Yeah, no, I don't need the entire list. I was, I was just curious. Changing over to this technology, does this impact that? Uh, we actually had a discussion with the contractor Ducey yesterday, and our equipment is compatible with what he's installing. Okay, thanks, Mayor. Oh, I'm all set. Thank you. You're all set. Um, do any of the chiefs? Uh, uh, or Joe Gray with the ambulance. Do you have any questions for this, for DOT? No? Gents, thank you very much for the presentation. We could go on a lot longer, but we do have, we, we are pressed for time. We will run over to get these reports in. Thank you. Thank you okay. to DOT. Thank you. And um, so what we're going to do is we are jumping right into the Central Connecticut Health District presentation. Uh, Charlie, uh, Brown is here. Charlie, focus on where we are in Connecticut right now, if you if you could. I do have four questions from the public. They're not a statement, so I'm not going to read them in this time, but I will get them to you so we can address the citizen. Okay, that's fine. Um, where we are right now is we're seeing exponential growth in the number of cases within Connecticut. Last Thursday, a majority of towns actually went into the red alert status which means that they've got higher than 15 cases per 100,000. And Rocky Hill was one of those towns. Um, and unfortunately, Rocky Hill went from the yellow, jumped right over the orange into the red. Um, so all four of the towns within the health district are now in red alert status. Uh, we've, we're seeing the number of cases within Rocky Hill has more than doubled in the last two weeks. Uh, and we're expecting more exponential rise in these cases. Uh, as we're moving forward. So we are really at the point now, especially going into Thanksgiving, where we really need to take action uh, to protect our town employees, to protect our citizens, uh, as we move forward into this very critical phase. Um, I know that Rocky Hill has had um, the opportunity because of low cases to really keep the town accessible um, and I encourage you to do that, but we really need to look at virtual um, opportunities for people to actually interact with the towns, um, controlling the town hall specifically, uh, making sure that people are wearing masks uh, everywhere. Um, it is not an option at this point. Um, and we need to assure that we know where people are going, uh, what their business is, so that if we have to do contact tracing, that we have the information to be able to do so quickly and efficiently. Um, this is not the time uh, to wait. We need to take action now. Um, right now, you know, we are seeing, you know, more cases um, that we have to do contact tracing uh, drop every day. Yes, just today from over the weekend, we had 130 cases um, that hit our four town district. Uh, that is the most cases that we've had in one day since the springtime. And we have already gone over the capacity for our contact tracers to handle this internally. So we are actually pushing cases to the state for them to start contact tracing at this point. That is how serious that this is. Um, 
So I really implore you as a town to show leadership just like you're doing with these virtual meetings, uh, to be able to really stress and communicate with all of our businesses that if they can function virtually, if they can have people working remotely, that is what they need to do. Um, because if we don't take action now, we're really going to be in a bad way here in a few weeks. Questions, John Emanuel, Councilor Emanuel? No questions. Thanks, Charlie. Councilor Prakash? No, Charlie, thank you for uh, that sobering assessment, I guess. Um, I think yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't say these things lightly, folks. I no, really I, don't. We know that. Charlie, like we, we know that. We we take it very seriously here, and as you know, and as as we share. So uh, no, thank you, thank you for that assessment. Um, I think uh, we can all like, you know, lead by example. To your point. So, thank you. Mayor, any questions? Charles, do you have something up on your website that's like in picture format? That's that kind of not that's not just the three W's, but that is bullet pointed like work remotely if you can, you know, they, or does the state have that where we can. I, I, that I think the governor has as under phase 2.1. Um, they put that out there specifically and there's a couple slides that they've used uh, extensively one to show the rollback into phase 2.1 that they did uh, here two weeks ago and then. All, but it also really emphasizes um, what communities should be doing as far as restricting meetings, restricting, um, you know, making sure that people, if they can work virtually, they should be doing that. Um, in addition to that, you know, if it's not essential, we're at the point right now to where we were in the springtime, uh, to where you really need to consider, you know, the task and, and things that you take on. And if it's not essential, you really should be putting that off, trying to find out what else you can do uh, to be able to meet that need. Um, we actually need to really pull back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. I really appreciate it. Before you go, I just need to ask, there's a Mr. Bryant Goodrich on our, on our Zoom. Sir, uh, could you state your business? Here at this meeting, are you speaking from the public? He's an EMS chief. EMS chief. I okay. <laughs> did not uh, did not recognize you as such. Okay, good enough. Charlie, thank you very much. We're gonna. Um, well, real real quick. If, yep. If I can, uh, yes. I just like to say uh, I'm not going to be at the town council meeting um, following this one, uh, but my staff and some board members will be attending. Okay. We'll get that question in. There's four questions from um, Krista Mariner, and maybe we'll try to get them in there. Um, a little more open time frame. Okay. Very good. All right. Um, that being said, department updates. Fire, Chief Gary. Thank you. And, and right off the bat, Ed, thank you very much for the moment of silence for Joe Kohanic. That was very nice. Um, Your loss is our loss. Thank you. A couple things real quick. Uh, incidents responded to. 54 last month brought us up to 519. 390 training hours were recorded. Um, and the majority of those were at the Newington uh, live fire facility. Newington was nice enough to uh, help us out and let us use their facility. Um, no injuries reported. Um, Staffing is remaining about the same, but um, with our cadets, and we have three at this point, um, we are now teaming up and partnering up with Newington Fire Department for training. They've got a few more than us, and uh, it's going to make the training more worthwhile. <clears throat> we put on no new members, but there are currently uh, three prospective prospective members in the application process. And uh, we've talked a lot recently about our accountability um, system hubs and uh, our ability to track ourselves on the fire ground electronically. The hubs have been installed. The system, we are uh, beta testing it at each call. Uh, we're learning a lot about it. And uh, 
we hope to have a go live date of uh, January 1st, but that might be a little flexible at this point. Um, engines one, two, and three, and truck one and two all successfully underwent uh, the annual required pump testing. Uh, we identified a few issues, a um, couple anomalies, but they were all corrected by the department's mechanical staff and uh, all five pieces of apparatus passed. Along those lines, engines uh, three and truck one and two successfully passed their required aerial ladder testing. Um, right after we did aerial ladder testing, we, we uh, did the annual testing, contractor testing on the ground ladders, and they all successfully passed. We also had our annual toes testing, which was about 19,500 feet of various diameters, of which about 1,250 uh, feet failed to meet the standard. And uh, we'll probably replace most of that. And uh, lastly, the required manufacturer's factory service was performed per contract on the three ladder trucks, that's truck one, truck two, and engine three, with uh, no deficiencies identified. And uh, in a nutshell, that's the report um, very quickly. Thank you, Chief Gary. Any questions, Councillor Emanuel? No questions. Councillor Prakash? One quick call out, uh, Chief. Thank you for putting that uh, uh, that data in for response times, uh, that was, that is very beneficial. And uh, we can we can talk. I know we are hitting time today. Uh, we are a little bit like you know challenged on that. So we can talk about it next week, probably and next time we do this next month. Uh, but that is very helpful. The other thing, uh, you also have the manpower analysis on this, like another uh, uh, data sheet you put in here, which is also very interesting. Actually, uh, I would just like to call out that literally like three categories like constitute 50% of your all uh, total man hours here. And I was wondering if there's an opportunity there, especially in like the gas lead, natural gas or LPG category, which is about 15, 20% of your manpower time. If we were to go down the route of uh, doing some kind of like uh, public uh, campaigns to bring more awareness to this, and maybe it can reduce some of the some of the uh, manpower hours like you, you have here. That's like 15, 20%, like I said, and I think uh, there's some opportunity here for, a, uh, for some public engagement, some campaign. Uh, but that's for later. That was just my commentary, by the way, because uh, I found it interesting those two reports you put in there. So we can, we can discuss it next time. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. If you can. Thank you, Chief. Uh, ambulance. Got it. Uh, for the month of October, we had 306 ambulance calls. Year to date, 3,717. We uh, slowly keep getting more new members in. We just got one more new member in, and there's a couple in the queue that they're working on their backgrounds with right now. So our membership is up to 81 people. Fantastic. Uh, we're working on the Santa Claus Express for this year. Um, every For the past four years, we've done Santa Claus Express. Uh, the children get to meet with Santa Claus. We usually do a parade and go around town. This year, unfortunately, due with COVID, we're going to be setting up at Elmridge Park and um, having a, a drive-by where they drive by, stay in the vehicles, and they get to meet with Santa Claus. That's going to be December 11th and 12th. And all the donations that we receive from that go towards some of the less fortunate families in town that would not have Christmas without us. So it's worked out very well in the past and uh, everybody's been very responsive so far this year. So it's almost full. We're looking forward to it. Great, thanks. Any questions for ambulance? No questions. Hearing none, uh, police, Police Chief Custer. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over the monthly stats. You have those, they're attached to your packet. Um, so if you wanna take a look at those. Uh, moving on to a staffing report. Uh, presently, we're working on filling six vacancies we have in the police department. We have made uh, four conditional offers and we're presently conducting background investigations on those four individuals. Uh, if everything goes well, hopefully we'll have those four on board uh, by January. Uh, we just posted a second exam uh, for certified officers only uh, in an attempt to fill the remaining two vacancies that we have presently. So uh, the deadline for that uh, is the end of this week. We'll be doing interviews uh, probably the following week and hopefully we can get a, a couple prospects out of that uh, exam. Um, other than that, the uh, most noteworthy news is uh, we have had our confirmed first COVID case in terms of a police officer, um, and, and that was confirmed last week and reported to us. Ironically enough, it was not a work-related exposure. Uh, the officer um, caught COVID from her spouse, uh, but nonetheless, she's out of work and she's presently quarantining, so we're monitoring that but that is the first case that we've had since this, all this has started uh, this past March. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to uh, mention tonight because um, you know, somewhat unusual last night, you know, we've, we've had numerous discussions about the um, car break-ins and we know the problem is, you know, happening in towns all over the state. Uh, last night on the midnight shift, 12 cars were broken into at Stepney Place. Now, what makes this unusual was all 12 cars were locked. All 12 cars had their windows broken out. This has not happened before, so it's escalating. Um, if you're familiar with the, you know, the, the, the apartment tower, it's, it's ironic that nobody heard anything. They didn't hear any breaking or shattering glass, so we suspect uh, the individuals are using some kind of uh, ceramic glass punch or something similar uh, that's very quiet. Um, and then it was kind of pretty much the same MO. They're going through the cars looking for valuables. One out of the 12 cars did have uh, their rims stolen. Um, so obviously they're, they're interested in that as well. Um, but again, I just wanted to report it because of A, the number and B, the fact was all these cars were locked. Uh, so we've had a lot of them you know, over the past several months but they've been just hitting unlocked cars. So this makes a first, uh, I don't know if it's a trend, but it, it seems to be escalating. Um, other than that, um, just getting back to the COVID ca uh, case. So as Charlie has instructed, we have ramped up our uh, protocols here at police headquarters uh, and for officers uh, in terms of exposures with the public. Uh, so we've heightened that as well. So I think we're, we're pretty prepared. Um, I think that pretty much does it for police. Questions for Chief Custer, uh, Councilor Manuel? No questions, thank you. Councilor Prakash? No questions at this time, thank you. Sure. Chief, how's the um, <clears throat> uh, outfitting of uh, cams for officers and patrol cars going? It's it's going well. Uh, so we, we, we've ordered our first round of 20 cameras body cams and 20 uh, mobile cameras. So right now we're at the stage where we're having them installed. Once we have all uh, the vehicles installed, uh, we'll go through the testing process. We're presently looking at policy um, in regards to the use of the body cam and the vehicle cameras. So uh, once we have all that put together and the back end infrastructure has been installed by the vendor, um, we'll be looking at implementing a limited number on an experimental basis in early 2021. Don't forget, this is not mandated till uh, 2022, so we're ahead of the curve. Um, but, you know, I want to get them in, obviously, as soon as we can. So they're being installed. We're working out the policy, um, <clears throat> and then we'll do a little experimental dry run uh, just to get used to the system and then full imp implementation sometime in uh, 2021. Uh, one other quick question on staff on the staffing idea. Um, 
I'm aware that like say other towns use a auxiliary officer, maybe um, they would hire some folks and get them trained up and they would ride along with patrol officers um, and progress, progress through uh, to have certain, you know, more and more authorities and do a lot of traffic duty at the fairs and all that kind of takes some, you know, that takes some of the load off that way. Is that something that we're looking at in town or you've deployed before? We're actually using uh, our police cadets for those types of uh, operations. So back in the day, they had supernumeraries in Connecticut, um, but those have slowly been phased out because now they require as many training hours and certification hours as a full-time officer. So you might as well be a full-time officer at this point. So, um, but a lot of departments are going is to volunteer auxiliaries, or in our case, we actually use our uh, cadets in our cadet program. And are we um, solid on SRO coverage at the schools when they're in session? Yes. Yeah, yeah we have, we've had a plan since the uh, opening of school. And as you know, uh, the high school has been closed the past two weeks. Uh, so we kind of just moved that extra coverage over to the remaining schools. So it's, it's been working out well thus far. Thank you. All right, if there's no question, more questions for police, Thank you, Chief Custer and Emergency Management, James Ballinger. Uh, good evening. Um, today, the uh, Rock Hill Public Schools Safety and Security Plan was completed and released out to all the participating partners. Um, the Board of Ed is going to be releasing it to the state of Connecticut. So that was a complete rewrite and we're gonna be working on it next year uh, on modifications. Um, on our Emergency Management website, there's a link for a FEMA mobile app. Um, you can do it for Android and Apple products. Uh, what it does is it gives you the ability to sign up and receive real-time alerts through the National Weather Service, uh, share those notifications with friends and family via text, email, or social media, and it gives you emergency safety tips for different types of emergencies in addition to what we have on our website. Um, I am currently working on the emergency notification platform. It's ongoing in regards to a change that we may be making, um, but I don't have any other updates on that. And uh, the last COVID EOC meeting that we had was on November 4th. The next one is this Wednesday on the 18th. Um, with that meeting, we started, uh, well, we restarted all emergency services, giving us their um, equipment list. So that way, it, makes it available for sharing if we need to. And the state of Connecticut EOC is requesting personnel numbers for each agency. So that's been updated to web EOC. That's all I have. Any questions? No, no questions. Thanks. No questions. Thank okay, you. thank you. All right. Um, thank you for your indulgence and moving along quickly. Uh, any old business? I don't see any new business, other business. Uh, town manager, John Mayer. You're on mute. Uh, no business. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, aye. Good night, all. Good night, thank you. Stay safe.